the, the hymn before the offering, there's a phrase in that hymn <coughs> that said, sin is broken, sin is broken. I don't want to get the tune right, but and it reminded me of an old hymn that we used to sing um, and still do that the Wesleys wrote, Charles Wesley wrote. I'm just going to read you a line of this. And it's called, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise. But there's a verse in there that goes like this. He, meaning Christ, he breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood avail, uh, avails for me. And, and part of what we've been looking at the last four weeks, are, we've been focusing on relationships and, and some of the slippage that occurs in those relationships um, for, a, for a variety of reasons. We talked about loving one another, encouraging one another, respecting one another. And this morning we're talking about forgiving one another. <clears throat> and I don't care who you are, or wh where you've been, or what kind of relationships that you've been in or are in, there's at some point in your life as a human being that somebody's violated your trust. Uh, sometimes there's some of us, I think, that, and the reason I thought of that old hymn is because we say, well, I'm a Christian, I've given my life to Christ, but I still have these behaviors that I know are not consistent with the way God wants me to be. I still get angry, I still do this or I do that. I, maybe I violate somebody's trust. And, and so, you know, how, what is that? And how do I get beyond that? Um, if you've been in a relationship, if I, as I've said, somebody's violated your trust. Maybe they've harmed you or betrayed you or abandon you, or hurt you in some way. For most of us, those experiences have been in the past, and maybe we're living in some of those in the present. But the truth is, sometimes what happens in the past still has impact and affects us in the present, right? It still has some kind of gravitational pull and so we experience these relationship slips, relation slips, we're calling them, that makes our relationships go sour and not be all that they can be. And so we're looking at, and we started this four weeks ago, looking at what we are thinking are God-centered ways of behaving and living in relationship that honors God and, and makes a contribution instead of, instead of withdrawal or subtraction from those relationships. And we've been looking around this little phrase that occurs multiple times in the New, Te in the New Testament, one, these one another phrases. The first one was love one another and, and encourage one another and respect one another. And today it's forgive one another. And any time, this is kind of a value added, any time you have something that repeats itself in Scripture, kind of a recurring pattern that occurs more than once or twice, you know that it has significance. This is something I need to pay attention to, and this one another phrase occurs 54 times in the New Testament and in the scripture that Bob read to us a moment ago. It says, be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgive one another, just as in Christ God has forgiven you. And so why is this so important? Besides the fact that it's foundational, to our Christian faith. Because the truth is <clears throat> that we offend each other all the time, don't we? I mean, it's part of the way relationships kind of function is we live in these relationships, and when it's early in the relationship, there might be a lot of ways that we offend one another, but the thing that I tell couples occasionally, I had a professor that told me this in, when I was in school. He said the primary thing that married couple, new married couples have going for them is the desire to make it work, and that's about it. It's not too optimistic, is it? But at least there's some optimism there, I guess. So why is this important? 
because of this, that it's part of relationship, one. And two, forgiveness might be the hardest thing you ever do. And it's not possible, I don't think, to have a relationship without having the element of forgiveness. I don't think that's possible. Now, one of the advantages that you have, and I also tell this to couples occasionally, is that a Christian marriage has some things in it that I think a secular marriage may not necessarily have because bringing a Christian, bringing a relationship into the sphere of Christianity or following Christ or honoring Christ has a moral implication to it, it has an ethic to it, and a behavior that goes with it, and forgiveness is part of that. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. Think about the relationships that you're in. That may be marriage or work or friendship or family, or it may involve the people that you worship with, the church you attend. Imagine a world that had no forgiveness. Imagine that world. I think it would be impossible to have a relationship. You know? Trust me, Beverly and I have been married 43 years and our relationship would not have worked without the element of forgiveness in it. Had we not forgiven each other, there are little things that we do and say every single day that stand sometimes on the only single nerve that's left. And that gets irritated. <clears throat> we're, re we're redoing our, our, we had a shower leak and we had a guy come over and say, oh, yeah, we've got to redo it. So we're redoing the master bathroom shower, so we have to go upstairs. So everything's kind of in the floor of the shower, the shampoo. There's no shelf in there. And uh, the shampoo bottle, if you leave the lid open, water gets in the shampoo bottle. And I said, hey, Bev, let's close that because that shampoo gets watery. And Oh, yeah, okay. So go, you know, a couple of days later and take a shower and pour the shampoo out, and it's just water, you know. And, hey, look. Close the lid on the shampoo. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, we annoy each other. We offend each other. And that's how relationships work. Everybody that's in relationship, you understand that, right? Right? There are a lot of things I do that annoy Bev, like not paying attention to everything she says. Last night she was sharing with me some of those things and if I'd have paid attention, I could have told you what they were. <laughs> and so that's, that's annoying. Uh, she can give you a list of the things that annoys her about me, and I can give you the same list of things that annoy me about her. And why is that? It's because we are flawed people. We have a human condition that we suffer from. We are humans and we are not perfect and we struggle with this human condition. That's why in that hymn it talks about he breaks the power of canceled sin. And sometimes between my trust in Jesus and the effect it has on my behavior, there's a lag. Just because I give my life to Jesus and he turns me around doesn't mean necessarily that my personality changes or my behavior is caught up with my commitment in Jesus. What Jesus did on the cross, he broke the power of sin that's canceled. He breaks the power of canceled sin, but sometimes the reality of that takes a while to catch up inside of me. And we suffer from this human condition, and there are times that we need forgiveness. We need to forgive somebody, and we need to be forgiven for the things that we do, that perpetrate this hurt in somebody else's life. And there's a ton of slippage in relationships. When we're talking about loving one another, we talked about this maybe attitude sometimes, that, well, maybe I'm better off alone. And that's not a good thing. We're, we're created. We're going to experience today at Charge Conference that God created church and he created community and he created relationship, and we can't live alone. That's not the way we were designed. There's no language in Scripture that talks about how to live alone. But there's a lot of scripture about how to live together. And I'm not talking about singleness. 
a lot of us maybe choose, or some of us choose to be single in life, but that doesn't mean we're alone. If you go to church here, you're what? Part of a community, right? So you're not alone, you're part of this community. You with me? The second thing we looked at when we said encourage one another is we sometimes maybe think, well, people don't need my encouragement. They can handle life on their own. And the truth is we all need to be encouraged. And last week we looked at we need to respect each other. And we talked about this tendency to think, well, I don't have to deal with the conflict or the tension relationship. I'm just going to let it go. And sometimes we damage the relationship when we don't deal with those issues in us. And today we're looking at this fourth slippage, and that's this notion. I don't need to forgive. Forgiveness is about them saying they're sorry to me. It's on them, not me. And I think many of us believe that forgiveness is about them or someone saying they're sorry. We were taught at a young age, now you need to go tell them that you're sorry. And you need to forgive one another. And we're kind of taught that way, aren't we? Right? We think that forgiveness is about saying we're sorry. So let's say that I left the front here and walked up and just smacked Frank Andrews, our administrative council chair, right in the face. And then I said, Frank, I don't know what got into me. That wasn't the right thing to do. I'm sorry. What do you think he's thinking? Well, that cancels that. We're good. I mean, would that make it good if I said I was sorry to Frank after I smacked him in the face? I doubt it. So just saying I'm sorry for an action or a perpetration doesn't necessarily dismiss the hurt that I've caused because forgiveness is not an event, it's a process. And so before I get into that, I want to talk a little bit about what forgiveness is not. And there's four things, quickly, these four things. Forgiveness is not ignoring or excusing someone else's sin or foibles. And this is where we get hung up sometimes. We say, well, I, I can't forgive, I can't sit here and pretend that this didn't happen, and you don't have to. The truth is you shouldn't. Because if we're living in a healthy relationship, we're holding, there's an accountability in the relationship, and forgiveness is not about for, for ignoring something that's happened. That's not what forgiveness is. Second thing, forgiveness is not continuing, it's not necessarily continuing in the relationship. I hope, and my belief and trust in God is that God created the institution of marriage and he created relationships, and I hope we can stay in them. But it's not always continuing the relationship that's healthy. There are going to be things that happen in life where you need to confront somebody and you deal with, in the relationship, the need for boundaries that are healthy. And sometimes if those boundaries continually get violated, you need to think about, maybe I need to step out of the relationship. I tell folks that come to see me, if there's physical or emotional abuse in this relationship, you need to step out. Because that's not the way we live in relationship. So that's number two. Number three, forgiveness, I said it this way, forgiveness is not always immediate. Generally, forgiveness is not immediate. I wished it were as easy as saying, I'm sorry, and then it's over and done with. But depending on what's happened in our lives, forgiveness may take some time Forgiveness is a process we go through, and it's not always, it doesn't always happen as an event. Sometimes we have to work on it over a period of time. Lewis Smeets was a Christian counselor. He wrote a great book called Forgive and Forget, and after counseling thousands of people, he identified this process of forgiveness. The very first chapter in his book, and I'm not going to preach on his book, but you ought to read it sometime, he says is hate. Sometimes when we experience such injustice in a relationship, our only response can be one of anger. And he says anger is not sometimes strong enough. It's not always immediate. And the fourth thing, forgiveness is not fair. <clears throat> Getting revenge is fair. Getting even is fair. 
but that's not necessarily Christian. And we're talking about doing God-centered ways, right? Right? Are y'all with me? And I know this is kind of heavy stuff, and it may be more heavy for some of us than others. Um, so in a relationship, don't expect fair necessarily. Because there are going to be times when forgiveness is needed and it's not particularly even. And so that's what forgiveness is not. So what is forgiveness? And before I, I sh share with you this insight in forgiveness, I hope it's an insight, is I don't want you to be misled because when I read this, it's going to sound very cognitive, very rational. And my experience is most of the time in relation to forgiveness, it's emotional and not cognitive. And part of the process of forgiveness, in my opinion, is the process of at some point connecting my rational ability with my emotional state. Does that make some sense to you? So forgiveness, my definition is forgiveness is choosing to let something go. Now that's pretty cognitive. And sometimes it takes us a while to get to that place. If we're going to have friends and you're going to be in a relationship with friends, there are going to be times that you have to say, I'm just going to have to let that one go. I've got this friend and uh, we were in seminary together and we developed a real strong friendship. He's a pastor up in Ohio. He's got a church that's been really successful. He writes a lot of books. And he and I used to speak together at, at conferences and retreats. And, and if they said, you guys have got two hours, and we were working on a particular theme, let's say forgiveness, for instance, just as an example, is Mike would say, okay, I'll take the first half, and you take the last half of the two hours. I said, that sounds fair. And we would work out what our content was going to be and how we were going to interact with the, with the group, you know, those that were in attendance. And what would happen invariably is, uh, is he would start and his presentation would last an hour and 58 minutes. And he'd say, okay, AC's going to come up now and do, and it'd be two minutes left. That's an exaggeration. But that seems to be what it was like. He'd go an hour and a half and I'd have 30 minutes. And it just irritates the crap out of me. And I'd say something to him, and he'd say, oh, yeah, you know, I just got carried away. I really am sorry. And then we'd go do another one, and it'd happen again. And so there's two conclusions that I came to in this relationship with this friend. We're still friends. There's a point maybe when we, we could have not been friends. But there's two conclusions in my relationship with him that I came to. One is I just kind of need to let it go. That's his personality. If he gets in front of a crowd, he goes with it. And the second thing I learned is I need to go first. Amen. Yeah. And so that's what we did. I said, okay, I'll go first this time. And so we're still friends. And so the question is, how do you get to the place where you can let it go? How do you get to forgiveness? In relationship, there'll be times when friends, when you're in that relationship with friends, and you'll have to say, I'm just going to let it go. I don't like what they said or did. But for the sake of the relationship, it's better that I let it go. And I could give you a thousand illustrations of all this. but And I know some of you are sitting there, and you're listening to me say this, and you're saying, AC, you have no idea what's going on. If you knew what's happened to me, or if you knew the awful things, that's been done or said to me or that's going on right now is you'd understand that I, it's, I'm struggling having it into my heart to move on, to let it go. And I understand that. That's why we're talking about this. And so today I want to give you two reasons why you should consider forgiveness as, as a Christian response. God-centered, God-honoring kind of response. And so here's number one. <clears throat> My forgiveness of others is forgiveness for me. Often we think that forgiveness is about the other person 
and that it's about, about them, but more times than not is we realize that it also is about me. And if I'm going to be a whole person, I need to go through this forgiveness because it's for my benefit, it's for my health, it's for my well-being that I go through this process of forgiveness. And Jesus taught his followers about forgiveness. Listen to what he says in Matthew 6. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father in heaven will not forgive you. That's not such good news. Matthew 6, 14, and the Lord's Prayer, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we say, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. So we hear these words in Scripture, words like, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, unto you, and we say these things, we say these prayers, we repeat these things, but the question is, is it a reality in our lives? It's as much about me as it is about anybody else. And so if I can't forgive others, then it raises the question, why should I expect to be forgiven? The reality is when we have something against somebody and we haven't forgiven or we're not willing to forgive, it's like whatever the issue is that we take with us forward, it's like emotionally we're carrying this, suit, this emotional suitcase. And so every time that I have this pain that doesn't go, it's not dealt with, or, or unforgiveness, and I carry this hurt and pain with me, it's like I'm carrying it around in this emotional bag or, or suitcase. And I carry it with me, and it becomes a part of me. And not only does it emanate from this relationship where I was hurt, or this connection, but I, it's possible that I carry it into other relationships. So I told you, I think, maybe I told you last week or a week before, I don't remember, I had this friend that was a clergy person. He went through a divorce. And if you remember the story, he was real angry. He was bitter. He was just, he felt like, you know, he, just, he was just bitter. And I thought he needed some support. And so uh, he was... He was kicked out of the church, out of the ministry. His credentials were removed, and he was ended up driving a, he, well, he was in a rough place. And I thought, I need to reach out and give him some support. So I met with him every week. And the pain and the bitterness and the anger that emanated from his failed relationship over a period of time, what started happening is he started projecting that venom on me, that bile, that, that pain, that anger on me. I was trying to help him. And the point was that the relationship where the baggage was created, he carried that with him. And we carry, we tend to carry that into other relationships and it begins to affect us. And we may not even be conscious. I don't think he was aware of what was going on emotionally inside of him but it was affecting his other relationships. Sometimes we begin emotionally to stink. Maybe you've met, maybe you are there now. Um, maybe you're aware of the baggage in your life, maybe you're not. And if I'm not willing to forgive others, here's the question is what does my sin look like to a holy God? What does that baggage look like when God looks at me? Because what God chooses is to deal with me with grace. And he says, I forgive you. And what God expects is for us to forgive each other the same way he's forgiven us. If you're not willing to forgive somebody, you need to ask yourself, why would God forgive me? Here's number two, quickly. My forgiveness of others is freedom for me. It's when I choose to go through the process of forgiveness, is it becomes freedom for me. And so last week we talked about anger, and sometimes anger is a secondary emotion to hurt and resentment 
and betrayal and all those other things that go on inside of us. And we get imprisoned because somebody has hurt us and we haven't moved on. In uh, Michael uh, Patanini's book, The Telling Room, I'm not sure I pronounced his na last name right, but he was doing research on this book, The Telling Room, which is an interesting book. And he went to Europe and to his father's village town that he grew up in, and he noticed there was this old woman that every day she would walk up this hill from her house, and it was about for her because she was moving so slowly. She was crippled, walked with a cane, bent over. She was going to the cemetery, and it would take her three hours to get there, and three hours to get home, six-hour journey. And he imagined that she was probably going because she'd lost a family member, a husband, maybe a child, and going to the cemetery. And so he asked about this woman, what was the cause of her grief that she'd make this trip to the cemetery? People in the town said, she's going because of bitter hatred. Her arch enemy is buried there. And every day she would walk up that hill and back only to go to the grave of this person and spit on their grave. Now that's an extreme story to illustrate how sometimes we get captive by our lack of forgiveness. We get bound, imprisoned by the wounds of other people that have been inflicted upon us. We have to forgive and move on, otherwise the person that's inflicted the pain in us holds us captive and it affects not only current relationships but other relationships and future relationships. So forgiveness is a decision you've got to make to move on. And sometimes we're not even aware of the issues, the baggage emotionally. And we ask God to show us. Um, I shared with Sunday school class this morning. Um, my dad, you know, when he would discipline us, there was no reason to it. I remember him jerking me out of a truck one day. I was telling the class, I don't have time to tell you the whole story, but he just frailed me with this. Uh, Adrian Peterson kind of branch and uh, and then after he got through beating me up you know he said he said and don't do that to the truck again I thought well why didn't you tell me that in the first place and uh, and I w it wasn't until I was an adult and John Eldridge has written a lot about this it wasn't until I was an adult that I became aware of the father wound in my life and when I became aware of it by God's grace, I had the opportunity to sit down with my mom and dad one day. And, and the whole awareness was that when I became aware of these resentments that I had from growing up, I realized that those were affecting me as an adult. That some of the behavior I had as an adult was because of the baggage I had emotionally. And I was able to sit down with my mom and dad and share with them this insight. It was emotional, let me tell you. And then they told me their story and their stuff. And there was this, this power, this forgiveness, because now all of us, were, we were in Christ. Sometimes we think that we need to be go to the person, which I was able to do with my mom and dad, and sit down and talk with them. And sometimes we can't go to the other person. Maybe they're no longer here. But the reality is we don't have to hang on to these guilty verdicts in our hearts and live in anger and carry it with us. Because when we do that, we're playing God. And we have a God. And Jesus has broken the power of sin and it's been canceled. And we have the opportunity to invite God by His grace to come into us and free us. And so the reason you should choose forgiveness is for your own freedom. And maybe right now there's relationships you need to pray about. And so we're going to continue our worship this morning. And as the band comes, I'll remind you that there is communion at